We're going to read now the account of Jesus' death from Luke, chapter 23. We'll be reading verse 26 to 49. You can find it in your pew Bibles on page 884. And I'll give you a moment to turn there with me so that you can follow along. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of the women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do not see things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching, But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, Into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. This is God's holy and inerrant word for us this evening. At the foot of the cross, our sins are exposed. We're really good most of the time at trying to cover ourselves. We're good at making excuses for the ways that we sin. We're good at hiding the guilt that we feel by telling ourselves that it's someone else's problem or it's it's some kind of oppression that comes from outside, from the society around us. It's something that comes from the culture. We're good at speaking of our sin as if it's just a natural part of us. It's just part of our personality. Others will have to deal with it It's just who I am. It's how I was made. It's how I was born. 
It's not something I can change. In some ways, we like our sin. We like how it feels. We enjoy the pleasure that we get from it, even if it is illicit. We like that we can hold on to anger and feel some sense of superiority over those who have wronged us. We like that we can hold on to bitterness in our hearts and feel like we have one up on someone else. We like to build ourselves up in pride. Don't you try to cover up your sin? To try to hide it? It's what Adam and Eve did when God came walking in the garden after they had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They ran and they hid and they tried to cover themselves because they were ashamed. But God isn't fooled. He wasn't then. He isn't now. It's at the foot of the cross as you look upon God in flesh crucified that you can see your sin for what it is. What does sin do when confronted with the truth? Well, here it is. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life was crucified. That's how sin responded to the truth. He was degraded. He was treated like a common criminal. The King of glory, eternally begotten Son of God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. Through Him were all things created in heaven and on earth. Apart from Him, nothing was made. In Him, all things hold together. And he was treated like a criminal. He was dragged up a hill and laid on a cross. Nails were pounded through his wrists and ankles. That's how he was received. There are many reactions in the text that we just read that highlight what sin does when the truth appears. It show us what sin is when it cannot be hidden. There are many ways that people still respond to Jesus as the gospel is proclaimed. And I think probably we can all relate to some of these. Some, were told, cast lots to divide his garments. They didn't care for Jesus, but maybe they wanted something that they could get from him. Like this was a bonus for them. They could get his robes. They wanted some material benefit that they could receive out of his suffering. And maybe they thought there was still some power in it. A lot of them had seen the miracles that he did. Maybe they thought it would just be some kind of memento, some kind of good luck charm. Maybe they just wanted new clothes. But that's what they did. As a son of God, God in flesh was dying They cast lots for his clothes. Some just stood by, we're told. They watched. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to think of this man on the cross. They should have known. But they didn't. Jesus made very clear who he was. His works made it clear. The word that had come before had made it clear. His own words had made it clear. And yet they still stand in ignorance. The rulers, were told, scoffed at him. These are the religious leaders. These are those who should know better. They're the ones who know the scripture, who are supposed to be prepared for the Messiah. Blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. This is where these rulers were seated. This is what they were doing, scoffing at the Lord. He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. They belittled him, knowing what he had done. Knowing that he had raised the dead. Knowing the miracles that he had wrought. And they still belittled him up on the cross. This is where sin takes you. The true God, the light of the world, being jeered at by those who he was currently sustaining the breath that they used to spew this hatred at him whose breath that 
he had given them, that he allowed them to have, that he could take at any moment from them. And they used it to jeer at him. The soldiers were told joined in with the mocking. They called him the king of the Jews. They mocked him for it. And you can imagine what a pathetic image it would be. There's this plaque that reads, king of the Jews above him, giving him his title. And here he is on the cross, beaten and bruised and bloodied, no crown except one composed of thorns on his head. He's naked, he's dirty, sweaty, he's dying. How could this be a king? Well, it was. He was. The title was true, though put up in irony. One of the criminals next to him was mocking him as well. He was using his dying words to try to get something out of this, to curse the Savior of the world. When Jesus breathed his last, then we're told that the sun itself was darkened. The light of the world seemed consumed in darkness. And they knew it. Everyone there, however they had reacted to him, however they were trying to cover up their sin, they knew it. They knew what had happened. They knew what was going on. They maybe couldn't rationalize it. They maybe couldn't speak it. But something in them knew. And so we're told in all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, that's what they think of it. And this is a spectacle to them. It's just another crucifixion. When they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. They knew that they were guilty. They maybe couldn't work it out all the way and fully articulate it, but they knew that what had happened was wrong somehow. Their conscience wouldn't let them get away. They couldn't hide from this sin, at least not fully. I imagine that night there were many that sat on the edge of their beds, not being able to get to sleep, just feeling the weight of that sin. It was your sin that held him there. That's why Jesus died. It's not because of just those 2,000 years ago who stood around him and mocked him and jeered him. It's also because of you and your sin. This is the welcome that our sin gave to the Lord of glory when he came into the world. This is how we received him. Look at him. See through the scripture your complicity in his death. Feel the, the weight of that sin. You can't hide from it. Not when you look at the cross. And what that sin got, right? where, it, where it led. The most grievous of all things. You can't cover this up. The reason that you feel guilty at times is because you are guilty. And this is the judgment we're told. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. All of this is revealed at the foot of the cross. This is where it's most clear. That is your sin. But do you know what is far more clear at the foot of the cross? In this text that we just read, do you know what comes across all the more? Do you know what is greater and more potent and powerful than your sin. Father, forgive them. In the middle of it all, in the pain and the sorrow, 
the scoffing and mocking, the false accusations, the degradation, the wrath of God being laid upon him. What does Christ say? We see how sinful people receive Jesus, but how does Jesus receive sinful people? Hear his voice. Call out in the midst of the slander and the laughter and the shouting and the mocking. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Such love in the midst of it all. Right here at the cross. This is where you see it. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Sin is slavery, but Christ came to set the captive free. Sin is darkness, but the light exposes and removes the darkness. Here at the cross was the greatest of all sins, the darkest of all moments in human history, and yet, at the same time, it's the foundation of all forgiveness. It's on the basis of this great love, on the basis of Jesus Christ being an offered up as a a, a sacrifice to satisfy God's justice. That God himself made a way by which you might receive the complete and total forgiveness of your sins. Every one of them. You don't have to cover up your sins. Because the Lord has provided already a covering for you. Just as Adam and Eve were covered when the Lord sacrificed an animal and clothed them in animal skins after they had sinned. So too, he has covered us with the righteousness of Christ. You don't have to try to justify yourself in the eyes of others. You can have true everlasting justification through the shed blood of Jesus. You don't have to make excuses for the guilt that you feel. Your deeds in the flesh are what bring guilt. And you are guilty, but you don't have to carry that guilt because Jesus will bear it for you. You may feel ashamed because of the things that you've done, the things that you don't want others to know about. But if you bring them even right now to Jesus, he will take the shame. He will take the mocking and the scoffing. He will take the nakedness and the belittling. He will take the wrath that you deserve and he will take it all when you come unto him. This is what he offered to us at the cross. Those who loved their sin and hated Jesus were trying to obfuscate their own culpability in the sin. They tried to tear him down so that they might look good. They might build themselves up by seeking to destroy him. They tried to hide from the light because they knew that it would expose the deeds that they had done in darkness. In a way, they were projecting their own wickedness onto him. He's the evil one. He's the criminal. He's the one that deserves to die. And the irony of that is that this is what Jesus came to do. To take the wickedness of those who would come to him. He that knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The time of ignorance then has passed. You have sinned, and I know that you know that. I'm not trying to lay it on heavy just because I enjoy doing that. I know that you know that you've sinned. We feel it in us. Our conscience bears witness to it. But Jesus still stands to forgive all your sins. If you have come here in Christ tonight, your sins are forgiven. If you've come by faith, that forgiveness that he offered at the cross, it is still yours. And if you haven't, it still can be. Turn your eyes then to Jesus. Don't look to your sin 
and hide from it. Instead, go to Christ and hide yourself in him. Find in him the complete forgiveness of all your sins. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us to see you tonight through your word proclaimed. Help us to see in this gospel reading the heart that you have. We ask that you would help us in a deeper way even now to understand and know and receive your forgiveness. Father, we know that our sins condemn us, and so we look to you, not to ourselves. Have mercy on us, Lord, we pray.